parts of the Ministry of Defence. Tonight, Newsnight can reveal that Britain is about to spend two and a half billion pounds buying some fighter bombers for the Navy, encouraged by the man who used to be the head of the Royal Navy and now earns a tidy sum from the company making the planes. Mark Urban has more. Explain. Well, this is huge for the Royal Navy. They've pinned their future to large measure, in large measure, on the future of these two carriers. Six billion plus to build them, and what are they going to fly off them? Uh, after various zigzags uh, in policy over the last few years, they've really only got one choice. This plane, the F-35, we were expecting the first production order to come this week for various reasons to do with the government schedule and contractual negotiations. It hasn't, but we've been finding out what it's going to consist of. The F-35, the world's biggest ever defence project. Britain is about to commit itself fully with the purchase of its first production aircraft. But along with the capability to land vertically, fly stealthily and combine sensors to the latest weapons has come delay and a trillion dollar global price tag. Britain, the Royal Navy has pinned its future on the plane and the aircraft carriers that will launch it. There's so much riding on the F-35 for Britain. It's going to replace the Harrier and the Tornado. It's central to the future of the Royal Navy and the military aerospace sector of the economy. And yet the programme has been plagued by development problems. It's years late into service and the eventual costs to the UK are only just becoming clear. As head of the Navy, Admiral Jonathan Band threatened to resign if the new aircraft carriers weren't built. Now he's with Lockheed Martin, the F-35's makers, delighted that his dream is about to be realised. A production order for the F-35 to me is a very exciting moment because we are now, by the end of this decade, going to have a credible carrier air capability which this country can deploy and importantly the current debate we've had and we've seen about whether you know we're still up for the game in the United Kingdom whether we're a serious player with carrier air we certainly are is that status then that we're it's buying? more than status it's capability I mean there is a status obviously in having these capabilities but there's an operational confidence in having them as an operational confidence uh, in deploying them, and it's the credibility that ownership of that gives you. Britain's F-35s were first meant to enter service in 2012. Now that's slated for 2018. With 8.4 million lines of software code, it's the most sophisticated plane ever made. Last year, the Pentagon estimated that only 2% of that software fully met its standards. The biggest outstanding problem is what's called Block 2B software, vital for the plane's missiles, radars and combat systems. Critics in Washington argue it'll never work properly. As an air-to-air -air fighter, it is a, it's a target, not a fighter. As an air-to-ground bomber, its range and payload are very modest. So far, this airplane is not working as advertised. It's almost a decade behind its initial schedule. Um, even if it performs up to all of its performance promises, the design is so modest, it'll still be a huge disappointment. The Pentagon and the manufacturers insist early snags have been solved and testing proceeds apace. The aircraft has gone to sea too, part of a plan to get it into service with the US Marines late next year. But even if that deadline's met, will the aircraft be capable of much more than takeoff and landing? Trying to combine uh, uh, all the various mission profiles that could be required from the Air Force, the Navy and the Marine Corps, as well as um, the you know, British requirements, Italian requirements, Israeli, Japanese, South Korean, all these various different air forces have their own say because they put money in. It's obviously going to increase complexity. As for the price tag, Britain's first 14 planes will cost $96 million each. That's £58 million at Sterling's current high level. 
but the price of buying aircraft with spares and an initial manufacturer's service package is much higher. The Pentagon estimate is $253 million or £154 million per plane. We can reveal that Britain will be paying about £2.5 billion for its first 14 aircraft, the initial support package and maintenance facilities for the future F-35 fleet. Little wonder that a cost-minded defence secretary is moving gingerly ordering the first 14, or that the plane's champions insist that an eventual buy of 48 suggested by MOD just isn't enough. If we're going to continue to have one aircraft carrier available 24-7, uh, you know, 365, then we will not do, and, and put as much capability as that deck size will give us, 48 aeroplanes certainly won't be enough, and my anticipation is we'll buy well north of that. Britain's F-35 is meant to enter squadron service in 2018 and be operational on the carrier in 2020, and that may be achievable. But to get a fully functioning aircraft with the whole array of RAF weapons working on it will take longer. That could be a decade from now, even on the more optimistic projections that we've been given. Political and industrial logic militates in favour of committing now, for the F-35 will sustain thousands of high-tech UK jobs. But some other partners are still delaying waiting for costs to come down and the plane to meet its performance targets. The combat systems in particular aren't mature. Um, you only have to look at uh, countries such as Australia and Canada, which are long-term partners in the uh, F-35 programme, who have both decided to go for an interim buy of, um, in, their, in uh, the case of Australia, um, F-A-18 Super Hornet, um, to keep them uh, sort of tidied over through the capability gap and then intend to purchase F-35 uh, probably about 10 years down the line. So far, Britain has only pledged to buy one-third of the F-35s it once said it wanted. This country's commitment remains tentative due to worries about cost and performance. But with orders expected any day, it's a commitment that's about to become irrevocable. Oh, have we got this straight, Mark? This country is paying two and a half billion pounds for a handful of planes which have not yet been properly proved, promoted to us by a man to whom we paid an admiral's salary and who now works for the manufacturers. Is that right? Well, look, uh, they've got themselves into this position where this is the only aircraft they can put on these huge ships. They're committed to these ships. The two and a half billion, we think, includes quite a lot more than those 14 planes, certain long lead items, as they're called, for other aircraft, maintenance spares, all the rest of it. But this will be an extremely expensive aircraft when you build in the spares and support package and you sort of wonder about the political courage that would be needed to send them into action with such a limited weapon fit, particularly in the early years. Does the Ministry of Defence worry about how this might look? Well, I think, they, I think that has been a concern. Uh, they, they have considered some of the wider ramifications. There have been uh, bitter inter-service battles over the years about the carriers and about this aircraft. Uh, and I put earlier today to the Defence Secretary the point that it could be hard to justify this in a time of austerity. Um, and yes, this is an expensive aeroplane, but we've always known uh, that it would be an expensive aeroplane. It comes with an incredible uh, capability. It would be the world's most sophisticated uh, fighter aircraft uh, with a um, high level of stealth capability, so it will be able to penetrate um, enemy defences with very little um, radar signature, which makes it a very versatile and capable um, piece of equipment and it will uh, provide a, a backbone uh, to our air forces including our um, carrier uh, power projection for many many years to come. How worried are you that this thing might not work as advertised, it might take quite a bit longer to get it working? Yeah I'm not worried. Um, I've looked at this report and I've looked at last year's report and I've looked at previous um, years reports. Um, these reports have to be understood in context this is a very complex project. It is identifying uh, issues in the development of the aircraft. 
that in the overwhelming majority of cases are already well known about, well established, and for which mitigation or resolution strategies are already underway. Will it enter service though as a fully combat capable aircraft? Because we understand many of the most capable weapons the RAF has will not be integrated onto the aircraft by 2018, even 2020. Well, by 2020, when we uh, expect to declare an initial operating capability, um, we will have a comprehensive weapons fit. Now, I can't tell you uh, at this moment, because we're still in negotiation and this requires agreement of partners across the project, whether all of, for, for all purposes, we will at that stage be using specific UK weapons or whether for some functions we may be using uh, US weapons to be replaced at a later stage in the aircraft's development by dedicated UK weapons. But the capabilities will be there delivered by one or other of these weapon systems. When you look at the risks involved, isn't there an argument for waiting? So now, Mark, you'd like me to wait to, to order the jets for the carrier so that you can then run a headline that says carriers have no jets to fly off them. Um, I'm very clear that we've invested, the British taxpayer has invested over £6 billion in building aircraft carriers and my job is to get the aircraft flying from them, operating from them as quickly as we can so that this huge additional capability that we will have with these carriers and Joint Strike Fighter can be available and deployable as soon as possible. Well that was Philip Hammond talking to Mark earlier. Now the decades long soap opera in which the Church of England decides whether women are capable of 